morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Here we are again, and God has gifted us with another day of life. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. with our opening sentence and on the page 35 and following to God the only God who saves us through Jesus Christ our Lord be the glory majesty authority and power which he had before time began now and forever blessed be the Lord our God by whose grace we are yet alive blessed be his son Jesus Christ by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. We pray together. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power through your Spirit. May we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. The canticle, the jubilate. O oh, shout to the Lord in triumph, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good, his love and mercy is forever, his faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Now we have this opportunity to make ourselves right with God as we open our hearts and acknowledge our sin and seek God's forgiveness. And so, we take a moment of silence and bring before God those things that particularly weigh on our consciences. And let us confess our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life, which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we come to our psalm. And the psalm appointed for us this morning is Psalm 18, verses 1 to 20. Psalm 18, verses 1 to 20. The psalm begins on page 486. Let us recite the psalm together. I love you, O Lord, my strength, O Lord, my stronghold, my crag and my haven, my God, my rock in whom I put my trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation, and my refuge, you are worthy of praise. I will call upon the Lord, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. 
the breakers of death rolled over me, and the torrents of oblivion made me afraid. The cords of hell entangled me, and the snares of death were set for me. I called upon the Lord in my distress, and cried out to my God for help. He heard my voice from his heavenly dwelling. My cry of anguish came to his ears. The earth reeled and rocked. The roots of the mountains shook. They reeled because of his anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils and a consuming fire out of his mouth. Hot burning coals blazed forth from him. He parted the heavens and came down with a storm cloud under his feet. He mounted on cherubim and flew. He swooped on the wings of the wind. He wrapped darkness about him. He made dark waters and thick clouds his pavilion. From the brightness of his presence, through the clouds burst hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered out of heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He loosed his arrows and scattered them. He hurled thunderbolts and routed them. The beds of the seas were uncovered, and the foundations of the world laid bare. At your battle cry, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He reached down from on high and grasped me. He drew me out of great waters. He delivered me from my strong enemies and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into an open place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And now we come to our first reading. The first reading is taken from the book of First Kings, and we are going to be reading from chapter 3, verses 16 to 28. First Kings, chapter 3, verses 16 to 28. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly, clearly, it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine <coughs> and the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. While the other says, not so, your son is dead and my son is the living one. So the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living boy in two then gave half to one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because compassion for her son burned within her, please my lord, give her the living boy, certainly do not kill him. The other said, it shall be neither mine nor yours, divide it. Then the king responded, give the first woman the living boy, do not kill him, she is the mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. 
this is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. And now we will have the canticle on page 52 of our Books of Common Prayer, Jesus Saviour. Jesus, Saviour of the world, come to us in your mercy. We look to you to save and help us. By your course and your life laid down, you set your people free. We look to you to save and help us. When they were ready to perish, you saved your disciples. We look to you to come to our help. In the greatness of your mercy, loose us from our chains. Forgive the sins of all your people. Make yourself known as our savior and mighty deliverer. Save and help us that we may praise you. Come now and dwell with us, Lord Christ Jesus. Hear our prayer and be with us always. And when you come in your glory, make us to be one with you and to share the life of your kingdom. We will now have the second reading, which is from the Gospel of Mark. We are reading from Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 26. Mark 14, 12 to 26. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet, will meet you, follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eaten, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eaten with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And you who eat of this bread, you shall live forever. Now we will reflect on our reading today from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. We read from verse 12 to verse 26. 
So we must look at the background here. What is happening is that it is Passover time and Jesus is in Jerusalem. Now, very significant. Passover, Jesus is in Jerusalem. Now, we would know that Jews from all over the diaspora would, would come in from other parts, even from the Israel, would come in to Jerusalem to celebrate this great feast. It was a feast that was God had instructed Moses and Aaron to, that this feast, must, this feast must be instituted to be celebrated by Jews, no uncircumcised, and it's to be celebrated in perpetuity, is what God said. They were to recall by their celebrations in the Passover. They were to recall God's saving work in, in the Exodus, in setting them free from slavery and bondage in Egypt and on their way to this new land, the promised land. It was a celebration of God's saving work uh, in, for his people. And really, they recall this great um, event in their history, God's working with his people. They recall this event by, on the, on the great day, the 14th day of the first month of the calendar, by having this Passover meal. It, but it went on for seven days. There, there were other celebrations, but on that great day, the four, 14th day of the first month, there was this Passover meal. And that meal really, in each home uh, where they were celebrating, they would have put aside a lamb for a few days, and uh, unblemished lamb, and that lamb would be roasted. There'd be unleavened bread. There was to be no leaven anywhere in the house, recalling the situation in Egypt. And they would have roasted lamb on leavened bread, and there'll be wine, and there'll be this meal. And there was a liturgy, <laughs> interesting enough, a whole liturgy, um, which is, was celebrated in the home um, for the Passover. So actually, there were three times when they drank the wine. And there was a time when they ate the bread and, and, the, and the roasted lamb, and they were singing of psalms and so on. So. It was really a little liturgy. And what, where we are now is that the Passover is at hand and the, Jesus' disciples are asking, well, where, where are we going to celebrate this Passover? We find the city would have been crowded. People would have come, pilgrims would have come from everywhere and all the places would have been taken. And so, you know, where would they celebrate this Passover meal? And there we find God's provision, God's, you know, oversight of it all. And Jesus was able to tell them exactly how they'll be able to find a suitable place. And we read where they were, they had instructions. Go into the city, they'll find a man carrying a jar of water. Now, this is an, an unusual sight. It is not, men don't usually do that. And they follow this man and he will lead them to a house. And when they go to the owner, he would remind, they must remind the owner uh, the teachers, or teacher is asking, where is the guest room that we may eat the Passover, that he may eat the Passover with his disciples? And um, then they will be led to this room where, every, where they just, you know, everything is ready, you know, a room all prepared, and they just had to organize the meal. So interestingly enough, Jesus knew exactly, guided by the Father, knew exactly the place where they would be having this Passover meal. Very important. And essentially, we could look at the institution of the Lord's Supper. What we see when we think about it is the Passover was a memorial. They were to remember the Israelites in the new land in which they arrived. They were to remember always, and they celebrated every year, God's saving work, God's powerful work in setting them free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, the exodus, we call the whole thing. That exodus was called powerful work in setting them free from the bondage of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh in Egypt on, on to, and eventually into the promised land. They were to remember God's work forever in perpetuity. And what we find when we read this institution of the Lord's Supper and all that Jesus said, a very important point which we see throughout the, the, the Bible, that very often 
we find that the Old Testament is just foreshadowing or pointing to a greater, a greater event in the New Testament. Some transcendent. It, it is. Or we put it another way: the New Testament transcends or fulfills, you know, events in the Old Testament. And we could see it in this case as well, because Jesus is taking this Passover meal that he is eating with his disciples, and what we see here is Jesus is instituted a new celebration not of God delivering his people from bondage in Egypt from bondage slavery physical bondage slavery in Egypt into the out into the promised land but something say the spiritualized the spiritual side of that so that what is happening in Jesus is that Jesus will be the means by his death and cruci by his crucifixion and then uh, resurrection and ascension God now is setting his people free from the bondage of sin so that they might not go to the a physical land the promised land but they might find their place with God in eternal life so the whole what we see here is the Passover as the Jews were celebrating it is transformed into what we call the Eucharist today a memorial, yes, of God's sending his son to die on the cross, to shed, for his body to be broken and his blood to be shed, so that by his sacrifice, his people might have their sins forgiven and so have access to this new land, the promised eternal life. And this is what's happening. So Jesus, when he in, in the appropriate part of this Passover meal, he took the bread, he says, this is my body. This bread that we are eating, which harks back to, you know, the Passover, that first Passover, liberation from Egypt. This bread is really my body. Jesus now refer, uses it to refer to himself. He is the lamb, the new lamb, the new Passover lamb. And so, the bread that they're eating, he says, is now you must consider to be my body. And then he took the cup at the appropriate part as they're drinking the wine. And after he blesses and gives thanks, he says, this wine is, is my blood. My blood which is going to be shed for you. This wine is now my blood. The blood of the lamb. The new Passover lamb. And it is by this body which you must, this, which is this bread representing my body. You must eat it, take it and eat it. This wine, think. Take and eat this body. In other words, we must appropriate it to ourselves. Take it, make it, make it very much a part of us. Believe, have faith that this bread that we eat is in fact the body of Christ. As his body has been broken for us. Let's see as we eat this bread. Let's think of it. Let's understand it as the body of Christ. The body that will be broken for us on the cross for our salvation. We must believe this. We must accept it. Internalize it. It must be that faith that we have that Christ will give his body. And every time we eat this bread, we must remember it is Christ. Christ has given his body for us. And every time we drink this wine, we must remember it is his blood. His blood will be shed so that we might have forgiveness of our sins and access to life eternal. This is my blood of the new covenant, Jesus says. So Jesus is instituting a new covenant, covenant by his, not the old covenant that Moses mediated at the foot of Mount Sinai, but a new covenant by his blood. A new relationship, a whole new relationship with God, a whole new dispensation, if you want. This new covenant, my blood, this is my blood which will be poured out for you. Believe that I will shed my blood, and by the shedding of that blood, you will have life and have it in all its fullness. That you are being instituted, a new relationship with God is being instituted through this new covenant of my blood. 
So what has happened here is the old Passover, old, old Passover, has now, you know, been converted into this new covenant, this new relationship with God through Christ, through the body and blood of Christ that will be given for us. And through that body and blood, we will be set free, not from physical bondage, but from the bondage of sin. And we will be, we will find our way through that, that new dispensation of, of, of forgiveness of our sins, set, being set free from our sins. We will be led into that new life, the possibility of that new life, eternal life with our God. So here we have, you know, another example of the old, the New Testament, the fulfillment, the transcending of the old in the new. So Jesus is the new Passover lamb and through the shedding of it, the breaking of his body and death and the shedding of his blood, we have forgiveness of all our sins. If we truly believe, we must really take and eat this body and drink this wine, his blood in faith that, that Jesus indeed has died for us. And as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, we will truly be beneficiaries of that salvation, that freedom from sin, and have access to that new life, eternal life, that Jesus has opened up for us. The Lord be with you. Unless you the flesh of the Son of Man and drink continue with the Apostles' Creed on page 42 of our Books of Common Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue as we pray together the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with the collect for today. It is found on page 177 of our Books of Common Prayer. It's the collect for Papa 16. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. We continue in prayer. Into your hands, Lord, we commend ourselves this day. Let your presence be with us to its close. Strengthen us to remember that in whatever good work we do, we are serving you. Give us a diligent and watchful spirit that we may seek in everything to know your will and knowing it may gladly perform it to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue to pray as we pray for God's world and God's people everywhere. We pray for all those countries of the world that are undergoing all kinds of problems, national disasters. We particularly think of Haiti at this time, devastated by yet another earthquake. We pray for the people who have been so severely affected, for those who have lost their loved ones. We pray that the rest of the world will be set up and, and seek to render assistance to the people of Haiti in their time of need. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, which is now in turmoil. For all those countries of the world where there is one kind of trouble or another, we pray for God's, we pray for God's help upon them. And today we pray for our Anglican Communion. We pray for the Most Reverend and the Right Honorable Justin Welby, who is Archbishop of Canterbury and Head of the Anglican Communion, titular head. We pray in our own province for the Most Reverend Howard Gregory, who is our the Archbishop of the Church in the province of the West Indies. We pray for all the bishops in our various dioceses in our province, and we pray especially for our Bishop Claude. May God's hand continue to be upon him, bring healing and wholeness, strength and wisdom and courage, especially at this time as he is, has gone apart for rest and reflection, that he will return with new ideas and ready to continue his service in this diocese. We pray for the Anglican, all our parishes in this Anglican Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago, for all our priests and deacons, and indeed for all our people, that God's hand will be upon us and we will seek to do God's will as we day by day encounter our various situations. May we so conduct ourselves wherever we are that others will come to know of God's love and grace to us. We pray for our country, our president, prime minister, all those who make the decisions that affect our lives. We pray for God's hand to be upon them. We pray for all our people today. May we be concerned about one another in all our actions and our words. We pray especially today for those who are in need, the sick and suffering, those who have been severely affected by this COVID-19 virus. We pray for them in whatever ways that they have been, they've suffered. We pray for those who are even victims of crime in, in this situation. We pray for them. We pray for those perpetrators who, under these conditions, are still bringing harm and hurt to others. We pray for families, Father, for your blessings and guidance upon parents. We pray you let Enable our parents, Lord, to be able to carry out even under difficult conditions their most important work of bringing up their children. Inspire them, and we pray for the children themselves, Father, 
protect them from those who would lead them astray and along the wrong path. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so we continue the prayer of dedication on page 47. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.